Hi, Dr. Ron England here, and we're going to left, leave, uh, start with web programming right where we left off with part one of Visual Studio 2012. And this time I'm going to take you from the application. I have the same application up here, which is essentially the same default application uh, that you get when you create a web forms application. I'm going to go ahead and start it back up in Firefox, and uh, we're going to do something here. We're going to kind of see how that works. So if I bring the browser over here, we'll see that we're connecting. And I'm starting with the same application, uh, COP4834 application that I had before. And I haven't done anything to it since that time. Uh, well, actually, it has pulled something. I'm gonna, I've created the login. Um, what we're going to do here, and see the good old new title is still there. I'm going to go ahead and register a user. Okay, so I'm going to hit register here. And now, when I create this register user, and this is, this is I haven't written any code yet, um, I'm going to go ahead and throw in a username, an email address, a password, repeat it, and hit register. Now it's going to go into the background and start doing some stuff. We're going to look at what it's doing here. Now I'm not going to remember this, so look at that. I now have over here in the right hand corner, hello, R. Eaglin, that's the username that I created. And if I log off, I can turn around and log back in with that pass same password that I had before. And now it's letting me in and off. Well, let's take a look at what actually is going on behind the scenes so you can have an understanding of part of this. And then let's go ahead and try to do something a little different and use some open authorization ability to log in here. So let's go back over here. Let's stop the debugging. And let's see if we can figure out what happened. Well, if you want to trace this, uh, let's trace from the very beginning of what actually occurs here. Uh, I have to go back to the site master. And in the site master, I have that link, which was the register link. And the login link, we'll look at both. And you notice that that's in account register.aspx. Well, that means that we can go up here to account, and we should see register.aspx. And we can bring that file up, move this over a little bit, and we can look a little bit at the objects that are here. So what objects do we have? Well, first thing that we've got right here, the first object that we've got is a create user wizard. It is an actual object sitting on the ASP page called a create user wizard. And notice that it has the name register user. Okay, the ID of this create user wizard is register user. So this is an object that is actually on this page. Few other attributes of this uh, of this are set, but the one that we're going to be mo find most important is this onCreated user, and that is an event. When you create the user, it's going to go to a method called register user underscore create user. So, in other words, something's going to happen when the onCreated user event gets triggered. Well, that event gets triggered when the user actually clicks the button here at the very end within the create user wizard. So let's look a little bit of how this whole thing is embedded. Um, and I'm going to close these so you can see them. I don't need to see this age group. That was my header group there. Um, now I'm going to see here that I've got the create user wizard. I have a little bit of information about the layout. And I have two placeholders here. Placeholders are simply places, that, uh, a little chunk of code that says, I can put something in here later. I'm not going to worry about those right now either. Now. Within the create user wizard, and what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll put a space in here if, and watch what IntelliSense does. If I go right here and I start an open tag, I can see all the methods and properties that go with the create user wizard, like step style, text body style, tile text, all those things that you can have within the create user wizard tags. Now, the ones that I need are already there, so I'm going to actually take that out of there because I don't need it, but I wanted you to actually see what these pieces come up. So one of those is wizard steps. And within wizard steps, let's look and see what we've actually got as available to us there. You have complete wizard, create user wizard, step, template wizard step, and wizard step. Okay, so let's close that guy down and let's see what we're doing here. Well, the next thing we're doing is we're creating a user wizard step. Okay, with the ID register user wizard step. Well, that makes sense. You got this ID that goes with it. And what's in there? Well, First thing I've got is this little a, a content template, which is going to be all the stuff within that step. 
And content templates are actually used over and over again with all sorts of ASP objects. It's the materials that are in the inside of inside of this wizard steps in this case, and specifically inside of this create user wizard step with the ID of register user wizard step. So the first thing we're going to see here is that we actually have this little message here. Passwords are required to be a minimum of, and now I've got um, an output here of membership dot min required password length, characters in length. So it's actually pulling some information from an object called membership. Now we're going to, have to look a little bit of where did this whole thing come from? This membership dot min required password length, but where did the membership object come from? So Right now, you would have to say that this membership object, well, first, this is a class property because I haven't instantiated this membership. It is a class, okay, so I haven't instantiated it. Um, so this is somewhere in the system, and it is actually something where, where we do have something to find, but we're not going to go there yet either. We're going to continue forward and come back to that. However, that is a property of that class which is actually going to be enforced within your application. So we have a uh, literal here which is going to be an error message so that we have a place to put error messages if we've got them. And now I've got a registration form. And that registration form is actually embedded within a field set. Well, the most important part of this is is what's in that registration form. So we've got a few fields, a label and a text box text box has a first text box has the ID of username then we have email then we have password then we have confirm password it's very easy to look at this and see how these these are actually put put together and you notice that these also have an associated control ID okay which allows these to be able to be associated that's the labels have have ability to be associated specifically with the text box that goes with it right here which is kind of interesting here and then we've got some field validators um, in this case a required field validator a compare validator validators are relatively straightforward and I do have a number of lectures already on validators labels and text boxes so to learn how those work you'll have to look at those specific ones because I want to move forward what's really important though is that I actually have the ability to pull this information from within this form, which is within the content template, which is within the create user wizard step, which is within the create user wizard um, tags right there. So essentially what's going to happen is we're going to pull this information and do something with it. And the information is the information that you entered within those text boxes. What you see here is that there's a lot of built-in objects, some pretty amazing capabilities already built in. So Really, what actually happens as far as an event, uh, as far as an event being triggered, we're going to go right back all the way up to the create user wizard, that on created user, register user, because that's something that's actually going to be triggered specifically when we have that user created. And where does that occur? Well, if we come back over here now to the uh, solution explorer and underneath register user, uh, see, underneath register user, you should have, uh, unless I already have it up, nope, there we go, it's just taking a second to come up, the, the uh, C-sharp code that's behind it, there's that, register user underscore created user, okay, and there's the code that actually executes on that part that the a user is registered here. So we actually have a forms authentication object which sets a cookie, and then we have, what, what we have here is that a little bit of code that specifically says, hey, where did you come from? What page did you come from? Please go back to that page once you have registered the user, which is what does actually occur if you notice when I did the register user there. So you saw me register a user. You saw me use it. Well, where did all that information go? I actually entered a whole bunch of information, and it did go somewhere. Well, for the answer to that question, we're going to actually look at some of these objects here. To do that, we're going to go down here to the web.config. And looking at the web.config, we've got some objects that are defined here. And now we're going to start, as, as we progress on, we're going to actually learn all this stuff that's in this web.config. But the one I'm going to look at specifically right now is this one, default membership provider. Okay, default membership provider, because what's actually happening is we've got this membership provider 
which is actually allowing us to create the user log logins. And let's scroll over and look at these providers. I have a default. I have a default. The default membership provider and it looks at the specific type. It is a default membership provider, and you notice it's built into system.web.providers, so it's an object that's already there. But here is something that looks pretty important. Connection string name. Connection string, whenever you see that term connection string, you should think somewhere underneath this, there's a place that's storing this data. And in this case, the connection string tells us where is this all going. Well, you see that there's some other attributes that you have here, but we're not going to, you know, and these are all things that you may want to change at some future part, and they're all pretty straightforward, like min required password length. Well, guess what? We saw that, okay? Remember, we saw that the membership provider in the register.aspx actually had a min required password length, and now we can see, going over to webconfig, where we've actually configured this to occur. Okay, well that's good to know, and it's really not that difficult to look through these attributes and see what you can do with them, but let's look at this connection string next. Connection string name, default connection. Well, where is that defined? That's defined in the same web.config. We're just going to go up and look at this. Over here, in our config sections, we have connection strings. Connection strings are strings that allow you to attach to databases, and we have one called default connection, which as you recall was the one that was in the membership provider, which actually has a system.data.sql client that tells me right away that this is actually using SQL Server as the back end. And then the connection string, which specifically goes to a data source, which is at a local DB, version 11, okay, and it has an actual database there. And if you go to the very end, you'll notice that it's an MDF file. And if you're familiar with SQL Server, you'll know that an MDF file is actually where SQL Server stores its data. And it has an ASP dash sample application COP4834 with a number .mdf. Well guess what? If you go over, um, if you actually were to go and search on this, you're going to find that that database exists and it's sitting in the app data directory of your project that you built. Wow, it's actually all there. Everything ties together. Now, if you wish to, you can actually open up this database within SQL Server and you can look at the structure of this. However, there is absolutely no need to do that because the membership providers and all those providers provide you the capability of managing everything that you might want to manage with individual users. You just got to get used to those specific objects. But you see me trace through this entire structure of how this register actually occurs. And it's pretty interesting that all the stuff that you need to do this is literally built in. And as long as you follow the conventions that go with using the membership providers, you've got this ability to register users, store the information in the database, and have that available. Well, suppose you want to go one step further. Let's bring this register over, and let's just say, you know what, I want to log in. Okay, this is the same one. Oops, I don't have it running in debug mode, but it should still run. Um, okay, now, guess what? I've got this ability to log in, which I, by the way, if I use my login that I just created, it's going to work just fine. But you know what? I want to use a different service to log in. I want to use an open authorization service. If I go to the article that's provided within the specific thing here, it's going to take me to some information that tells me how I can enable open authorization, Facebook, Twitter, um, and, you know, all the way using different types of formats such as web forms, MVC, or web pages, which are three different ways of actually coding. Okay, we're only doing web forms in this one here. And we can look at, you know, it's even got the capability of doing it within Google. Well, how do I do that? If I wanted to do that within Google, well, first I would read that article. Um, however, I already know how to do this. I want to go over here to my open authorization providers, okay, and I'm going to actually look at um, within the account the code that's there. Oops, and it's not the right code. It's it's actually open auth. So um, Hang on, let me get, go back and read it real quick so I can remember which one it was. It's auth config and app start. So I go to app start and I have to remember where these are. Okay, and there's auth.config and that's a C sharp file. And I go into that C sharp file. That is where it's going to pull your authorization configurations. And I'm going to uncomment this one. Authentication clients at Google. Well, that's kind of interesting what it's going to do. So now if I save this, control S, and I go back over to Firefox and I bring this application up, I can now go over here and it's going gonna, it's gonna to connect in. 
and it's going to connect in nice and slowly. I hit login. Now, if I look at my login this time, it's actually going to give me the capability of using different services that enabled the Google service. Now, what it did is actually ask the open authorization services, are there any services enabled? Before, you got a message saying that they weren't. All the code that you need to do that is available, and you can see it within the ASPX page. Well, if I want to use another service to log in, I can actually click on Google. It will take me to Google that says, should I allow this? I'm going to go ahead and say that I'm going to allow it. And now, I can log into this website using my Google account. The information for the open authorization services that knows that I've used the Google account is actually going to be able to sit within the membership provider, which is in the database. However, the actual authentication goes out to Google to, to authenticate the username and the password. So I've got this ability to log in. I've told Google specifically, hey, let this group do it. And now I'm logged in underneath my Google account within this application. That's part one. We've actually looked at very quickly how to register and do some login simple things there. There's a lot more to it, but hopefully you've broken the curve of how to actually use this. The next thing, one of the other things we're going to look at is how to authenticate within an individual page. So we've moved tremendously forward in our capabilities of working with our default web application, and we're going to move much further along with doing this. This is part two. Coming up soon will be part three. Thanks. Bye-bye.